Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Raw Knuckles podcast. We'd really appreciate it if you'd like, subscribe, and share with a friend. Our captain, Billy Kitchen, shows up. And he's one of the last to show up in the dressing room as he's walking by everybody. It's like, oh, my God, what's that smell? And, you know, just shit yourself and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> anyway, he walks in and he goes and he puts his skate on. Well, he ties up the skate and all of a sudden there's something that comes out of the eyelid. And it's like he gives it a he gives it no. a wipe and no, gives no, it a sniff. No. Oh my good lord! Somebody sh- took the insole out of our captain's skates and shit in them. <laughs> I thought, hang on a second here. This this isn't right. When I stepped on the ice, I never backed down and I never stayed down. And I was vicious and I was malicious and I don't care. <laughs> Nice fucking hat, by the way. Thank you. Beautiful hat. H H S Howard Chuck Strong, my friend. Howard okay. Chuck Strong. Cool. cool. Say say hi to Tim, uh, Brian. Tim, yeah. Tim played in the NHL, uh, Toronto, uh, Winnipeg. Played over in Russia also. He's a fucking. Right he's a sniper. Yeah, just ask. Well, me. as a matter of just fact, ask. I'll show you. I got ninety six thousand hockey cards sitting over here. I probably got one of you in there, my friend. <laughs> it's Mike I'm going to try and sell it for three million dollars and tell him there's a whole bunch of Tim Stapleton yeah. collector's <laughs> items in there. Good luck. All right. Well, uh, listen. Let's get going. I have three million of mine, and the whole collection's <laughs> worth two cents. <laughs> All right, let's get going here. Uh, Brian, uh, welcome to Raw Knuckles Podcast. Awesome to have you. Listen, Tim, Brian Skrillin, one of my all-time favorite teammates and, and people. And I, I say that, um, and I don't say that lightly. I mean that. I got to tell you, um, I look at his career, other than the two of us being all-stars, because we are, <laughs> we were, um, <laughs> as a teammate, one of my favorites. And I look at his career, where he came from, not being drafted, winning a, a call the cup uh, his first year in Sherbrooke, winning a Stanley Cup in Montreal, Dallas. He went to four Stanley Cup finals, won two Stanley Cups. To me, yeah, you got to be in the right situation, but you being part of that situation – those four times you went to Stanley Cup Finals is incredible. And it says a lot about who you are as a person, a hockey player. So, honestly, like one of my – and I say that, my favorite teammates and a lot of good memories, and we're going to get into them today. Um, Screwy, growing up, obviously, um, playing for the Blades and, 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 you know, you had decent numbers in junior. Why do you not get fucking drafted? Uh, you know, there's uh, certain things in your life that uh, you always question yet at the same time, I, um, I don't know. I, I, that never bothered me. I, I didn't realize how important it was. And I, I think even more so today, if you're not drafted today, man, you're, you're probably, you got a, even more of a road to, to, uh, to cover than I did back in the day. Uh, I looked at it now that I've been on the other side of the fence and, and hung out with the scouts and, and the, the managers and the presidents, you realize like these guys have a job to do and uh, man alive, if a Brian Scrudlin happens to come along and all of a sudden he's pushing somebody else for a job and you know, you got scout number one and scout number two there, their guys suck. Uh, although they picked them quite high and they're not, you know, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Well, the Canadians had the balls to give me the chance. And, and uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of organizations, I don't think they do that. I think they, they fall short of that by picking the best player, the guy who came the most prepared back in our day as well. A little bit of training in the summer, put us a step ahead of, uh, of you guys, to be honest, uh, you know, knuckles, I don't know how much you trained in the summer, but it really wasn't a big thing back in our day. It was uh, it was more the fact of um, 
I guess just the the idea that you're going to use training camp to get yourself in shape. So, you know, us starting training back in the 80s was probably really beneficial for a lot of guys. But uh, I look at it now that I've been on that other side of the fence and I see man alive. Though Some of those guys, they might be better players. But when you get in that uh, those those back rooms and you start talking, it's like, well, I followed this guy. And, okay, he's having a bad training camp, but he's going to turn it around. Well, you know, I, I, I don't know if that works. They still get a chance, but at the same time, Man alive, I came in and I was hungry and uh, and you know I I just thank the good Lord upstairs that that I had the guys that were in charge, the Chris Nylans, the Larry Robinsons, the Bob Gainies, the Trombleys, uh, Rick Green. I mean, we had such a great uh, great group of veteran players and and they taught us the right way. There was a lot of fun. But a lot of competition, uh, Knuckles. You set the 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 standard for us from day one. You, you grabbed seven rookies, took them in the video room, <laughs> scared the yeah. living Jesus out of us. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was only one of us that paid the price in L.A. Yeah. for effing around before <laughs> practice. One, <day>. yeah, <laughs> we're still yeah. still trying to figure that one out. Oh, but anyway, you oh, what'd, what'd you, you say? What'd you say in that? What do you What do you mean he pulled you? I didn't hear about this. What did, What did you say to them? Knuckles? Oh man. We got out to, well, we, you know, whenever you were going out to LA back then too, it was the only yeah. hot spot in the National Hockey League. So you always went out, you had three, four days. Uh, you weren't losing going to LA and practicing for three days. So mm-hmm. we always uh, did our best to kick the shit out of the Canucks or whoever was en route on our way to Los Angeles. Uh, we did have a couple of really fun days off and all us young guys with the old guys had a, oh my gosh. Well, first of all, I never took any swimming trunks. I never took any uh, flip-flops. I didn't know we were going on vacation. Uh, so after our first time on the ice and, and uh, big number 44 steps ahead of number 30 on the ice, takes a couple of laps and he's doing the old, I'm just going to have a little skate here in the palm tree country and whack. Yeah. That was in Vancouver. Oh, I saw that whole thing and I thought, oh my God. What 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 just happened? Anyway, Bob comes out next thing you know, practice is delayed five, ten minutes because we got to scrape Reesh off the ice for God's sake. Well, anyway, uh, we I'll tell you, no I'll tell you long after that. Yeah, well, I'll tell you b- before that, and I remember Laws brought it up uh with us, talked about um how I brought all the rookies in and said, Listen, here's the deal. Bob's getting older, yep. Larry's getting older. You know, we got some good middle of the road guys here, and we got this big influx of rookies. You know, we yeah. we could have a shot at doing something here. So let's, you know, let, let's you know pay the price here. Don't screw around. Let's work. Let's have that respect for them older guys. Anyway, the thing that happened with Riche Steph was in Vancouver, and we were scrimmaging, and Riche was, you know, go, going through the motions. And I remember I hit him in the corner. I hit him hard, knocked him on his ass. He got pissed. So we're coming back up the ice and he came by me and he come by with a stick like that over my shoulder, kind of like, fuck you. And I just yeah. went, oh, boom. And I give him a two hand. It was, <laughs> it was fucking bad. It was bad, but that's, <laughs> that's how that all happened. And oh, I caught my. some attention. Yeah. yeah. I, I, Serge almost, Serge told me, I almost put you on a plane and brought you home to Montreal just to sit you yeah, down well. and talk to you myself, but I didn't. Let's face it. He was a he was a pretty big part of that hockey team for us at forty four. He oh, turned yeah, it he on, was. but at the same time, you know, we we all got a warning back in September. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we did. And so, Scrooey, um, yeah. So you go from June. Didn't you go to camp in Philly once? Or I did. As something? a matter of fact, it was the uh, eighteen years of age and uh, uh, got an opportunity to go out to Philadelphia. No, you so were I'll perfect for them. That. What, what, how did they fucking miss the boat? Because that you no, were I, perfect for Phil- Philadelphia. Well, I, I actually, it was kind of funny because I was so excited. I don't know if I was more excited about the hockey or the fact that I was getting on an airplane for the first time in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, it. quite a story though. I ended up going, I ended up going from Saskatoon to Toronto. Toronto to Boston, and uh, and training camp was in Portland, Maine back then. So then into from Boston into Portland, Maine. So we lasted a week. Uh, Pat Crochet 
was the uh, trainer back then, the physical trainer. So anyway, Croach got in the, the ring. They had a ring in the back room back then, teaching the guys how to spar and everything. So Paul Holmgren and uh, Croach are getting at it. And I'm thinking, wow, I don't know, man. I don't know, 18 years old. I don't know. Guys, this is getting a little crazy, you know. And Mad Dog Kelly, all these boys are still around. It was like, wow. I watched these guys kick the shit out of everybody for years. Anyway, I was so excited, but Croach... Uh, Paul Holmgren gave Croach a little extra one under the chin. He said, whoa, 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 Croach says, no no more of that unless you really want to get at it. Well, Paul says, okay. So away they go, and boom, boom, that Pat Croach, he put Paul Holmgren down in two seconds. I thought, my good Lord <laughs> Jesus, this is for real, right? Anyway, it was nuts. I go home three days later. They're sending me back home. Thanks for coming. I had a really good camp, I thought. And uh, so I'm sitting in Boston Airport, and of course I get get uh, sent home the same time as this young Frenchman, and and uh, him and I go back. We grab a case of beer, pa- grab a pack of cigarettes, drank the whole every beer, smoked every cigarette. <laughs> Next morning I'm up, away we go. We're back. I get into the Boston Airport, fall asleep in my chair. I wake up, and who's sitting two two seats down from me? The legend Bobby Orr. Well, my gosh, I'll tell you, I wow. straightened up right away. <laughs> yeah, well, and I had to say hi Did you speak and everything with else. Yeah, you spoke oh, with him. Oh, my God. Oh, you know me, Knuckles. I ain't letting yeah, that yeah. go by. Yeah. <laughs> this might be the last time I get a chance to meet him. Anyway, I uh, we have a good conversation, told him where I was coming from. It wasn't until four years later, I met Bobby Orr again, and he said, do you remember meeting me in the Boston airport? I thought, oh, are you kidding wow. me? Like yeah. these guys have memories, man. I'm telling you, they're just like elephants. Some of these veterans, they remember things like from way back. Anyway, I was so impressed. I thought, my gosh. And I couldn't imagine because I still had a, a buzz on a beaver. Couldn't chew it in the Boston airport from the <laughs> night before. So anyway, I, uh, oh, it was just something else. I just, just admired the old veterans. And that enlightened me even more to want to play the game of hockey. So when Philly sent you home, was that when in Mont? Is that were you thinking you were done, or like did you know you were going to go get picked up somewhere? Go no, somewhere? no, I was eighteen. I was oh, okay. eighteen. So I was going back. back. Yeah, I got. Yeah, you. going back to junior hockey. I had a couple of really good years from there, gotcha. and uh, like Chris says, why I never got drafted. You know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. There's uh, I, I I maybe wasn't the uh, the choir boy off the ice, but I certainly didn't do anything to uh, to. Um, keep me from getting drafted. And I watched some of the names as the draft came along. And and I had uh, Billy Waters as my agent. I had uh, been player of the month, I think, two, three times. Uh, player of the week, about 10 times. I got. I think I still have some brute uh, deodorant to prove that. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, and then uh, of course, uh, the day comes, it's my final year. I got in, in touch. There was a, uh, one of the owners, of, or one of the, the biggest supporters of our junior hockey team. He ends up, his uh, wife is the daughter of the Minnesota Vikings owner. Well, the, he knows a scout and this guy, he's going to get me. We're, we're going to get a tryout. So sure as heck, uh, Barney Harris flies into Saskatoon for that final draft, my final year of my draft. We didn't get drafted, but within uh, probably two, three hours, we had five invitations to camp. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I ended up going to the uh, Canadian Olympic team. Was one of the last cuts there. But the second tryout in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Dell Wilson came to see me. He had a package. Oh, he yeah. was an old scout from Western yeah. Canada for the Habs. And uh, they presented me with a contract. However, Dell said at this point in time, we want nothing but you to play for the Olympic team, get the experience. And but please don't forget that we're offering you this contract today and it's valid, Brian. So when whenever this Canadian Olympic team stops, uh, we'd love you to be part of the Montreal Canadiens. Well, I was one of the last cuts that year uh, called the Canadians. I was on my way to Montreal in uh, within two days. So and excited to be a Hab. I was a Hab fan growing up and uh, got a chance to live my dream. So did you so know? 80- you- Go ahead. Go ahead, Timmy. Go ahead. No, go. No, I was Timmy. just gonna say. Go. I was just gonna say. Like, were you? Uh, so, what was that first training? I mean, I was gonna get into training camp and like, what? What did you know about Nux before then? I mean, you, were you you were following Nux before you met him? Oh my good lord! Well, how can't you? <laughs> like I said, I was a Habs fan. So, first of all, I'm looking at this guy, and he's not quite as big as Dave Samanko or or uh, most of the guys in the league. But my, I'll tell you what. 
there wasn't a moment that I was ever thinking that someone wasn't going to be there to back me up. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until years later, and all of a sudden there's uh, Michelle Petit, Michael Small, and he's got a finger stuck halfway through my in my eye and uh, pulling, my, pulling my eyeball right out of its socket. And all of a sudden, I see two fingers going each one of his eyes. And, and uh, I think... I think at the time, Knuckles, you were renting a house to him in, uh, I forget where, or you were renting his house in Montreal? Robert Picard. Ro- it was oh, Robert Rob- Picard. Yeah, I was renting okay. his house. There you go. So that's yeah. who it was, sorry. <laughs> and uh, and I hear, he says, fuck, you, re- you, you, you rent my house, you pull my eyes out. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh, and I'm down on the bottom, just... Just pray to God I'm going to make it out of here alive. <laughs> so, so that first camp was at 83, 84, right? You end up going to Nova Scotia. Um, and yes. then the franchise, American League franchise gets moved to Sherbrooke. So you're in your second year, 84, 85. Now, that Chris, team. Chris, before, you, before you go any yep. further with that, though, I got to. So my first, I show up and. Mr. Guy Lafleur says to me, Brian, I hear you are my center. I said, oh. and I, I'm as nervous as can possibly be. I said, uh, yes. Fuck, you Mr. already Lafleur. talked to Bobby O of Guy Lafleur. Well. <laughs> goes, oh, yeah, well, that's why it just gets better, man. And uh, so he says, now, he says, you get the puck, you put it on my tape, I get you to assist. He says, you put it over here. You go get it again, bring it back, put it on my tape. I get you to assist. I figured it out pretty quick. <laughs> and I did get a couple assists that training camp. So, so that's anyway, your first sorry. camp. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. And then Nova Scotia, uh, Sherbrooke. And then you're with a group of rookies down there in Sherbrooke yeah. that, that um, obviously had a big impact the following year in Montreal along with yourself. How invaluable was that experience winning the Calder Cup in Sherbrooke that year with that group of players and then that group of most a good portion of that group of players getting transported up the road to Montreal and the following season end up winning the Stanley Cup. How 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 like crazy was that for you? Your first it two was years. Invaluable. Like, yeah, it was invaluable. That experience was something else. Uh, first and foremost, the year in Halifax, uh, John Brophy being our head coach, oh, we had God. a whole, we had a whack of uh, a whack <laughs> of older guys, veterans, uh, uh, Jeff Brubaker, uh, Dwight Schofield. Uh, these guys got these guys got picked up on the uh, expansion wire, or not expansion. Uh, oh, what is it? Free uh, the wire list, draft. Um, yeah. Yeah, something just before the season was beginning. Well, I, I, I'll i tell you what, like things fall into place. And and because I have a feeling I may not have made it out of the rookie initiation that day. They didn't. I was kind of a I was kind of a mouthpiece, to be honest. And I don't think either one of those no. guys really good for that too much. So I, I think they might have murdered me, to be honest with you, back then. I, I'm watching some programs on initiations today, and I might not be here to even comment on it if those two are still around. Yeah, it was great. It was, you know, and John Brophy, I mean, he kept things into place down there. We had Andre Boudry as an assistant. These guys had lived. They'd, they'd done the experience. They really were there for uh, – to help each and every one of us. So we had, uh, we had a young team, a bunch of young guys back then too, but uh, the majority was, you know, the Dave Allison's, the Mike Kitchen. Yeah. I, now, turning pro, I don't know if this is for the, I, hopefully everybody's had their breakfast, but my first year, we all get dressed at the Halifax Metro Center. Yeah. We got to drive our cars over to St. Mary's University that's where we're having our practice. Well, very small dressing rooms. You sit across from one another. I could tie your skates. You could tie mine. <laughs> anyway, we like I said, we're just taking our skates, sticks, and helmet, and you know, over and so our kitchen Billy or our captain Billy Kitchen shows up, and he's one of the last to show up in the dressing room as he's walking by everybody. It's like, oh my God, what's that smell? And you know, just you shit yourself and blah blah blah. <laughs> Anyway, he walks in and he goes and he puts his skate on. Well, he ties up the skate and all of a sudden there's something that comes out of the eyelid. And it's like, 
He gives it a he gives it a no. wipe and no, gives no, it a sniff. No. Oh my good lord! Somebody sh- took the insole out of our captain's skates and shit in them. <laughs> I thought, hang on a second here. This this isn't right. Not well, the our captain. Trainer was, uh, well, right. and our trainer was Brian Pataffi. Now we called him Spash Man because he sort of sounded like this, eh? So anyway, he says right away, Kitch, I don't know who's shitting your skates, Kitch. I don't know who's shitting your skates. Well. You, you know who's shitting his skates because you're the you're the trainer. <laughs> Trainers know everything. So any, anyway, you know what happens, and this is the funny part: why the trainer even lets this happen. Billy takes his skate, takes it off, and throws it at Pataffi. Well, it's, I don't know who's shitting your skates, shit. You know who's cleaning the shit out of the skates? It's Pataffi. Oh. I, so anyway. We're on the ice now, and it's like, where's Kitchen, John Brophy? Where the hell's our captain? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, I think Red Z, Dave Allison. Um, he had a little problem, John. Uh, somebody shit in his skates. Uh, <laughs> it was just like, what? He, so anyway, the door opens up, and here comes Billy Kitchen on the ice. He goes right across the ice, and boom. He cross-checks a rookie on our team. Who shit in the captain's skates? <laughs> a rookie. Well, that rookie ended up going home the rest of the year. He had free sweatpants and free sweatshirts. He went home with short sleeve sweatshirts and shorts for sweatpants. <laughs> Billy cut them every single day. He cut those shorts and t shirts. Oh. It was just like, oh my God. Who in the it hell would just- do that? Oh my God. I. You know, oh, I heard the well, story. I I'm allowed to use any names, but he was a pretty big guy. No, well, you don't have to. Anyway, let, but... me, let me shut the phone off real quick. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, the priceless. That's, that's priceless. ballsy. Oh, no, oh, that's gee. that's stupidity. Yeah. You know, well, that, I, yeah, you know, that is I kind of, you know, I kind of thought it was gross. I, I, uh, I, I, Man alive! I was thinking, okay, Billy, you gonna you got a new pair of skates? Or <laughs> I think that's what I said to him after. Hey, do you have another pair of skates? <laughs> yeah, you bring your back. I don't know what to say to the poor guy. <laughs> so after the shitting incident, uh, you move from Halifax to to um, uh, up to Sherbrooke. Sherbrooke. Now, who, who was the coach of Sherbrooke? That was it, Pierre Kramer. Yeah, Pierre no? Kramer. Yeah. Okay, so Pierre Kramer. Yeah. The, that year, obviously, you have a good season. All these new new faces come in: Pep Lemieux, Patrick Waugh, and then yep. um, you get in the playoffs. You end up winning the MVP of the playoffs. Uh, Jack Butterfield Trophy scored seventeen points, seventeen games. I mean, do you think that? I I don't know. Did did you think they expected that from you, or were they expecting what you did from someone else? Well, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, right, right. There you go. But I, how about that? that you myself, know, they got. They might, they, they're looking at you. With, come on, you're a check and center iceman. You're a hardworking kid. You know, uh, you're not the pure scorer, all that stuff. But you end up freaking MVP. I mean, that's fucking eye opener for the well, organization. Knuckles, I can describe it because you gave me the nickname. I was Chopper. always screwy and good. <laughs> screwy. <laughs> Chopper. And you threw chopper at me <laughs> and that, that one stuck pretty good for my whole career and people yeah. didn't ask hey why do they call you chopper <laughs> <laughs> that's that's pretty straightforward now we had so much fun that i think the the biggest thing of course we got that 168 pound goaltender uh oh. that his team had lost in the quebec major junior and that kid was just, I mean, Pat was incredible, as he was Ridiculous. for us the year out. Right. And for years later, you know. I mean, he would have played another 10 years, that bugger, if he would have known that Brodeur and some of these records would have probably been broken. I mean, yeah. he was still healthy enough and everything else. But, uh, you know, that was incredible. And then the the it was the idea of the support from the Canadians. That, that was next to none. I mean, to have, uh, once again, Mr. LaFleur to have Serge to have all these guys coming down and checking the games out and and being a part of it and coming down in the dressing room after and you know seeing those guys just just raised our spirits so much and then there we are in the finals against Baltimore and we're on a jet 
Holy oh, smoke! Wow, yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, Can only imagine you what you're thinking. Whoa. <laughs> the you're American like, League Jet. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh. I thought, man, alive. What happened to the U-Hauls or however we used to travel? Anyway, we uh, so that was pretty exciting, and then of course winning it. I, I like I words can't describe uh, the Canadians were all about hardware and silverware. And I mean, that's why we play the game right at that level. It's to win. And uh, Serge Savard, when we won that cup as being the captain of the team, I had the opportunity to take that cup with me in my uh, as Knuckles will attest to my beautiful 78 Dodge. Uh, <laughs> what the heck was it? Dodge Dart or whatever. No, I think I bought it for $300 from an older gal in Sherbrooke. Well, after we were done at the rink, I got that cup in my car. And who's in the passenger seat? Mr. Savard. Oh, shit. <laughs> he, ain't leave, he ain't leaving that hardware, right? He yeah. says, like, we haven't seen hardware since 79, Brian. you got to understand, <laughs> this is awesome. So uh, he grabbed a bunch of us that evening and, and said, like, you guys, you come into shape next year. The best shape, like, I need you to really put in a good summer uh, and, uh, you're going to get, you're all going to get an opportunity and man alive. Was he a man of his, of his word? Because, uh, there we are, what, 10, 11 months later, uh, raising a Stanley cup. So that was just an absolute thrill. What yeah. kind of player did you, was Michelle Terrian uh, on that team? You bet. Well, how, what kind As of a matter of fact, he was the one that shit in the skates. He was the one. No, 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 no. <laughs> Here, here's a good one for you. Uh, Stefan, Sylvain Lefebvre, Stefan Lefebvre. Uh, Michelle were roommates in in um, in Halifax, our first year. So Sylvain Lefebvre comes to me and he says, uh, "You won't believe what happened." I said, "What?" He says, "I go home, <laughs> and there's Darian, and he cooking the uh, craft dinner." <laughs> and so anyway, I hear the pop, and I hear another <laughs> pop, and then they're popping like kernels, like like uh, popcorn, <laughs> and just he, he put the butter in. He didn't boil them. He put the butter in, then add the, the noodle, and whoop, 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 they pop all over the kitchen. Well, some of them are so hot, they land on the linoleum floor and melt the kernel sized things all over the kitchen linoleum floor. Oh, wow. <laughs> that, that was back before they gave us cooking schools. Yeah. And that guy would oh, fucking coach the Canadians. Oh, yeah, that's shit. What I mean. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, oh, oh, it's amazing. Oh, yeah, well, he never, he never cooked his own noodle when he do the Canadian, huh? <laughs> oh, oh, that was too good. So you win that but, uh, Butterfield Trophy. You win the uh, championship down there, Calder Trophy. And then that next year, coming to training camp um, with the Habs and embarking on that uh, glorious season that we had. But – you know, with certain challenges and, you know, the pudding head was our coach. Um, as you well know, pudding head. And, um, you guys all called him pudding head. We called him Mr. Oh, you, oh yeah, sure. Or coach. <laughs> or coach. Sure. That's right. Or this way, I didn't shit, I didn't shit in the skates and I didn't tell any of you guys because you were shit in the skates. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! So that's right. You never called him Pudding Head. That's right. Um, uh, Jesus, I got to catch myself here. Um, so we get going on that season. I remember. Um, and I'm hey, sure Knuckles, you do. How could I ever call him Pudding Head? He put me on the ice in the in the finals of Game Two. What the hell was I doing on the ice in overtime in Game Two? He's the smartest <laughs> hockey man in the world. There's pudding head for you, starting you in overtime. Oh my god! Um, and and but, and of course, he obviously wanted to come out of that shift with a tie because I hadn't got a goal yet. As, as I said, our line has 15. Lemieux had 11, and McPhee had four. Oh, but wow. I want to go back to. And do you remember it? And Christ, we had some good time. When I think of Da Vinci's, I think of Guy Boisson when we used to go with Raffi, the little bastard, right? Uh, the stuff at Montreal. Well, we'll get to a, that. There's, a, there's an off. There, we, <laughs> we'll we get gotta, to that. Tell that one in a, in, when you open up your Triple X <laughs> yes. Chris Nyland podcast. <laughs> so um, I remember, and I'm sure you do, 
Well, Serge made that move, brought Bobby Smith in, and he 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 really solidified the middle. And and you were one of those guys. So, you know, the middle was, and we know it today. That center rice, if you got that depth, and um, it, it's so good for your team. And we did. We had that strong middle. We had Big D. We had a good sized team. But before we went, we went on a losing streak at the end of the season. We weren't good. We were like I don't know, like three nine and and two in the last 15 games or whatever it was. And I remember before the playoffs, Serge and Mr. Corey came down and spoke to the whole team. And I always remember that because, listen, they never – Serge never came down unless it was called for. He wasn't around the room all the time, did his thing. But I remember both of those guys. And even Mr. Corey, what he said, was so impactful. Do you remember that speech before the, the playoffs that year? It was quite moving. It was it was what it was all about and what it meant to the organization, to the people of Quebec, to the people of Canada. I mean, it, it was, uh, man, I wish they could have dropped the puck right then. Yeah, right. So they had that speech. We went back on that series and, you know, we, we dispatched Boston 3-zip. Then, you know, uh, Hartford, incredible seven-game series. And remember... Babbage scores with less than a minute left, and they had all the momentum going in an OT. Lemieux wins it. Then we slap New York silly, and then we go to the finals. And we get down. We lose the first game in Calgary, and then it comes to game two. And I barely got my asshole on the bench and got comfortable. And all of a sudden, I look up, and the game's over. I mean – how freaking shocked were you that that happened? When I look at that replay, I'm like, Jesus, I, I don't think I saw it in real time. I just looked up, I think, to see the goal at, at the end, and I'm like, what the hell just happened? I could not believe it. Fastest overtime goal in Stanley Cup history, and it still stands today, nine seconds into OT. I mean, you must have, Christ, like, how good a feeling. From the face off, McVay brings it in with Spurman. Well, Lana, Lana says to me that, uh, well, we had our three kids in 27 seconds, so <laughs> I guess I'm quick at everything. <laughs> it was uh, it was an absolute thrill. I, As a matter of fact, the last house that Lana and I have moved into here, a neighbor came by, and this is a quick little funny story, but he says, uh, hey, Brian, you're Brian Scrudlin, correct? And I said, yeah, yeah, nice to meet you. Anyway, first time meeting this neighbor. He said, uh, your brother is Barry? I said, yeah. He goes, you know, your brother was sitting behind me in game two of the uh, 86 finals. I said, oh, interesting. He goes, uh, you know, have you ever asked him if he saw you score that goal? I said, well, no, we've talked about it a million times, but uh, I've never really come out and asked him. He said, well, he never saw you score that goal. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, we went down and got our beers after the third period and your brother was about four behind us. Uh, we got our beer. We went. They stopped us at the glass. They dropped the puck. Bang, it was over. You scored. So there's no way your brother was even in, in behind <laughs> us in the concourse at that time. So, of course, as soon as this guy leaves, I got to give Barry a call and have a chat. He says, you go tell that neighbor of yours to F his hat. <laughs> I was sitting in my seat. I never got I never got out of my seat. I wasn't going drinking when you were going to score the overtime goal. Well, this is back in his drinking days, so I think he forgot. <laughs> well, anyway, probably did. We still, we still chuckle. We still chuckle about that, but... You know, it's amazing. Uh, it's amazing how nine seconds can change a man's career, though, because, uh, you know, I've had that uh, tag ever since 1986 and I couldn't be prouder uh, after the game. I'll never forget. And I tried to get the interview from CBC because they dad and mom and dad and the whole family were there, of course. Uh, so they come down and I said to dad, well, come on in to the uh, interview, you know, like or he they one of the guys from CBC, come on into the interview, watch your son. So next thing you know, he's sitting right beside me. And yeah. uh, so he's part, he's part of the interview. Well, I was so excited at one point in time, I turned to give him a big kiss on the cheek. Well, he turned at the same time towards me, whew, right on the lips. Right on the, lips. <laughs> well, right on the lips of national television. So it, oh, we chuckled. I tried to get that because I love my uh, – 
you know, where are we without that support of our parents? And it was just so special. How did that play yeah, even no. happen? You, Because I was just watching it earlier today. What was that a D-man doing? Or like what actually happened? Well, well, I go to, of course, I'm not allowed to talk about it because I do live in Calgary. <laughs> <laughs> But whenever we get together with the boys and they're giving me a hard time about 89, of course, I got a few things to ask them about 86. So I, I, my favorite one is probably to ask Jamie McCowan, uh, did he think Mike McPhee was going to pass to him going the other way? Because <laughs> all of a sudden he's gone. It's like, yeah. hey, maybe Mike will slip a backhand back into their zone and I'll have a breakaway. And I'll get the breakaway. Well, there's McPhee and I both, you know, heading in on Al McGinnis. And, uh, you know, I'm probably the only guy with a four by six that would take the chance of putting it off the post. Anyway, yeah, it was uh, what a thrill. I mean, we we to this day couldn't believe that that goal went in. But uh, but it definitely motivated us, uh, got us back on track and and uh, went in, went back home to a couple of really hard fought hockey games in our yeah. own barn. And, uh, you know, I, I still look back on it, and I think Calgary shot themselves in, a, in the foot by letting Dougie Wickenheiser and uh, and the St. Louis Blues back in it in game six because they yeah. would have had a couple extra days rest. But uh, that definitely helped us out in the long run. Yeah, it did. And we obviously go on to win that Stanley Cup that year, which was incredible. Here you are, yeah. two straight years, part of a championship team, and you're on your way. You're learning from some of the best. And, some of the best leaders yeah. and you picked up on, on a lot of things and that certainly helped you down the road in your career. But when we get back to Montreal, people don't understand and try and explain just how crazy this big city is when you win a Stanley cup. Yeah. Well, I was, uh, I don't know if you recall this or not knuckles, but in game five, uh, period one, Jamie McCowan, as I talk about him <laughs> negatively. Well, I was he hurt. Broke, he broke, he broke, Remember, I he was broke hurt. my jaw. Yes, you were. You were That's out in that yeah. game. He broke my jaw in uh, in the first period, and uh, I I knew something was really wrong. I mean, when when mm. I can't move my mouth, <laughs> something's really wrong. So uh, so I waited, and of course, you know, we were all so emotionally hyped, and there was always skirmishes after every whistle, and. Well, my mouth was so full of blood, and here comes Riser. He comes over to give me a whack because I'd whacked a couple of guys yeah. now after that happened. And and Dougie looked at me, and I'll never forget. I couldn't hesitate, but I give him a whole mouth of blood, and yeah. he lost it now. So at least I was going off the ice for 10 minutes with somebody. So I went right to the dressing room, and, and the docs, they, they, yeah, I think something's wrong here. I said, yeah, well. <laughs> Not today, Doc. We're <laughs> we're packing this thing up, and and sure as shit, am I not the luckiest guy in the world? My first shift on the ice, I'm heading. We're going in on a, I think it was a three on two, and and Lemieux puts it right off the post, right on my tape. Once again, four Bingo. by six. This, this time, I think I put it in the middle of the net, and uh, and that was my first shift back from the crack jaw. Well, we ended up, uh, of course, winning it. Uh, I don't know if there's a highlight of, at the end of it. And and uh, Matt Snazlin and I are standing on the bench together. And I really didn't want to get hit anymore. This thing's over. And Matt's turned and drilled me one more time. That's a good measure. And it was like, what the hell are you doing, you little sweet? And uh, so anyway, all excitement and away we go. But I knew I was screwed up. And we ended up getting back to Montreal, got to the doctor. I had three stress fractures in my jaw. Uh, because of my age, uh, and because there were a million people out every night after that to have a cocktail with us, they decided not to wire me up. And uh, anyway, it it, it uh, didn't bother me one little bit. It probably helped you guys because I was a little quieter. Uh, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> and but I'll never forget the parade knuckles. Oh. We're at one point in time, and you know there's a million people out there. I mean, it was crazy. Just, that was right. Crazy. And my head, it feels like a, I'm a buffalo. It's just mm -hmm. my jaw. And, of course, i got to get a couple of cocktails in me for the ride. <laughs> well, we got to one point in time where the whole thing had stopped. I think we were stationary for 10, 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. And we're on top of one guy's toes. It's like, you know, ah! 
ah, he's just screaming on the side of the road. Well, I just hopped out of the car. I thought, enough of this shit for a bit. I got to go into the bathroom. So I walked into a pub, uh, went to the bathroom, came out, and I thought, ah, the car still hasn't moved. So I thought, I'll go for a walk up. So I walked up to the very big, very front of the parade, and there's Bob and all the GMs or the surge. Larry and, and, on the and big I, float up the front. On the big float. The boys are all on the big float. So I'm standing there, and Surge points me out. He grabs on to John Perron. He says, look at this guy. <laughs> I was just standing there as one of the bystanders. <laughs> Nobody had a clue who I was. Right? John didn't so, know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who's John that guy? Asked, Who is that? Pulling ahead. <laughs> Who's that guy? He looked familiar, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. What a story. Like, I I just, I had so much fun Uh even after that next week and getting to all the, the taverns of all the boys. Oh. I mean, that was, uh, now I truly felt like a Montreal Canadian. Uh, right. After every round, Mr. Blake, Toe Blake would come into the, into the, uh, into the room. So we beat Boston. Yeah. Congratulations. You haven't won anything yet. Well, yeah. beat Hartford. Same yeah. thing. Beat haven't New York. Same yet. thing. Congratulations. You haven't won anything yet. Comes into Calgary. Well, we won, eh? I, he's got to change it now, doesn't he? He says, congratulations. That's only one. Well, it's only <laughs> my first time. <laughs> Do it again next year. You know? Yeah, you oh. bet. Those are the oh. expectations of being a have. And I'll tell you, it really, that's what it's all about. And it's too bad that we haven't had one since 93, but hopefully soon. If you love your pet like I love my St. Bernard Adele, You'll want to feed them a balanced, biologically appropriate raw diet. The reason I've chosen Formula Raw is because all blends of their food are locally sourced and they consist of exclusively human-grade meat and organs, as well as fruits and vegetables. And all products used are hormone and antibiotic-free. So like I said, if you love your pet like I love Adele, you choose Formula Raw. Make sure you go to FormulaRaw.com and use the promo code RAWNUX at checkout to receive 10% off your first order. That's RAWNUX, R-A-W-K-N-U-X. So, you know, that Stanley Cup obviously got it. I remember how gratifying it was from the standpoint that, you know, I got there going for number five in a row, and then all that transition and time, yeah. you know, I was about my seventh year and I'm getting a little older in the league and I'm time, you know, I'm, I'm not there yet. I haven't got to the final. You know, we went before we went to the conference final at Islanders the year before. We won the first two games. Yep. They beat us four straight. And time's clicking. And we win that one. It's incredible. I never, ever wanted to play for another team after being part of that organization. That is emblazoned on my heart and soul to this day. I never yep. wanted to go anywhere else. I ended up getting traded. I was devastated. I don't know how one guys of, One of the it. saddest days for me as a Canadian. Yeah. You got traded while we were in Buffalo. Yeah, yeah. And, Am I right? Yeah, yeah. And listen, I, I know I, I have my issues with the coach, and um, one of the things I never allow to happen was a coach tell me to fight or even make the inference, and we had our differences. Anyway, I paid the price. I stayed true to myself, though. Yeah. How about you? Because I know what you put into that organization the, the just less than eight years you were there. Uh, when it came time to move on uh, for you, what was that like? Because I'm telling you, it almost broke me. It almost broke yeah, me. Yeah, it, it was devastating, Knuckles. I, um, I never worked harder that summer to come into camp in shape. Uh, Jacques Demers was our coach. Uh, it was his first year. We went over to London, England um, for training camp. I actually led the team in scoring that training camp. And then very first shift of the season against Hartford, uh, I had my knee fallen on and, uh, and uh, tore my medial collateral ligament, was out for six weeks. While I was out, Serge signed me, I think, to the biggest contract for a uh, uh, plumber that you possibly could get at that point in time, which showed me that he had the confidence in my abilities, even upon returning. I mean, I worked my ass off to get back into shape. 
came back into the lineup and just felt like I just wasn't getting that opportunity. And yeah, I needed to do more and I understood it and, and did more in practice and, and blah, blah, blah. Well, uh, long story short, my last shift as a Canadian was a five minute spearing major. I uh, got into the corner. I think I was just so frustrated at that point in time. And, and uh, Buddy was cross-checking me, cross I said, one more and you're going down. And I got one more and boom, I turned around and I hit him right in the belly. And uh, that was it. And I, on the way to the rink, the next morning I called Serge and I said, I, I don't know what's going on. You signed me to this big deal. I said, my relationship with Jock is really frayed. I, I, you know, I don't know which way to go. I'd like to just come up and have a conversation with you. He says, yeah, come on up after practice. Well, I went up after practice, walked in his office and Jock Demers was sitting there. And uh, he and Serge, Serge said to me, he said, do you mind if Jacques sits in? I said, well, to be honest, I don't because Jacques has heard. I've been very honest with him as I'm going to be with you. And uh, I, I said, I'm, I'm just really questioning on on my ice time, uh, the situations I'm being put in. I don't find they're favorable for me at this point in time. And uh, Serge says, well, Brian, we have a new coach here. Uh I could make you a Calgary flame in five minutes. And I said, well, if you feel like that's the best thing for the organization, I said, you have to be able to do that. And uh, I said, but you know that that's not what I want. I, I never, ever like you, I, yeah. I got the CH right in my heart. Um, I was a flame in five minutes and on my way home, uh, I had to pull the car over and have a little yeah. tear because I was, oh man, I was pissed. Um, ended up going to Calgary, met the team in San Francisco. Uh, I walked into that lobby at the St. Francis Hotel. And after 86, 89 against the Flames, uh, there's Jim Poplinski. <laughs> well, he's down at the other end of the hotel. And all I hear is, screwy! <laughs> well, I, I see Jim coming my way and... He gets closer and closer, and then it's like, hey, welcome aboard. He says, by the way, my name's Jim, not Horsehead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I called him Horsehead for five years. I asked him, I said, by the way, we've got some hay in the back. If you want to come yeah. in scrums? I mean, I used everything. Like, like, hey. Uh, uh, so oh. I just knew I was going to fit oh. in with that group of guys, and they were a great group of guys. I mean, you know, they had a whole bunch of the veterans still around. And what Al the and, fuck and, happened and, there? You so, only there 16 fucking yeah. games. Well, okay. So, here, so here's one of the best. held group. it against you. He said, we got to get this <laughs> yeah. fucking guy out of here. <laughs> I will tell you. So in my, what the hell? I was traded in January 18th of 93. Uh, and, and the Habs won the cup on June 9th. I'll never forget it. That was one of the most terrible oh, bottles okay. of wine I drank in five minutes. Right. Um, and uh, my daughter was born June 10th. So I would have even been home if I was a hab having that. Anyway, uh, it was quite a story. I, I, I guess I was there for about a week. My coach was Dave King. So we're out near the bus after a game and Dave says hey, to me, keep says, going. I, 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 I got to piss, but you keep going. Okay. With Tim. <laughs> he I says, I piss. never realized you're as much of a hack as you are. And I said, what? He goes, I never, and, the, and there's guys standing around. Eh? And I said, I said, well, you know why? He goes, no, why? I said, well, I went to the King Seymour hockey camp when I was a kid back in Saskatoon. <laughs> That's where I learned to do that. <laughs> so, so I kind of put Dave in his, in his, uh, in his shoes at that time, but I, it wasn't going to work. Like Dave King was a good friend of my brother-in-law's uh, older brother-in-law's my brother-in-law's brothers, I figured, hey, this is going to be a match. I got a little bit of an in here, but no, it was exactly the opposite. So, but things worked out for me. They couldn't have worked out better. Um, you know, I, I had that opportunity to go to Florida. We put our imprint in the game of hockey down in South Florida back in, uh, in 93, all the way to 97. Uh, was more proud of, uh, of that and carrying that hockey team and, and helping that hockey team achieve what we all want to do, which is win. 
Well, I was going to ask you, like, uh, going back to, like, Montreal winning the Cup, like, do you think if if that year you got traded, if they do, if you don't win another Cup, is that, you know, you probably were able to move on after winning another Cup, but if you don't win another Cup, that would probably have been a, you know, I, uh, something that you just probably would still think about, right? You know, it's kind of funny. I mean, I, I felt like the most fortunate guy that first year, and you're thinking, okay, maybe I don't have enough toes and fingers to be able to put these rings on, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah. Yeah. it wasn't until 13 years later uh, and a teammate of Knuckles of mine, Craig Ludwig, and I went on to, to win that cup uh, with Dallas uh, as much as Carbo was there and, and, uh, and Keener and, and Bob and, and Dougie Jarvis. And so there was a real hab, uh, it was a real hab thing yeah. going on there and it was just a perfect fit, but uh, yeah, that would have, I, I don't know how I would have felt, but um the bottom line was I felt like it wasn't done. And we, uh, when I went into Florida, we had a really good hockey team. As a matter of fact, uh, in training camp, I think I put it the easiest way that, you know, I hated every one of those guys that was, that was uh, picked up in the expansion draft, which was perfect because who liked who back then, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, we didn't stretch and hug each other and warm up and, yeah. Yeah. and do the thing that's going on today. As a matter of fact, I was so proud of those Kochuk boys the other day when they were stretching and not even looking at one another because yeah, it's just right. about competition and it's about winning. And I don't know if you're willing to cut your brother's head off if uh, if you're having a chat and warm up. But anyway, that's the way we were, man. And if it was my brother and it meant winning, well, he's going down. <laughs> <laughs> now, Scrooge, I, I, I went ahead a little further than I want to at this point, but I just got to go back to it. I was in Boston my last year, 91, 92. Yeah. And Mike Milbury skates up to me in warm-up. He said, Knuckles, I'm coaching the All-Star game this year. And he says, uh, I'm inviting you. You're going to be, I'm going to name you, and I'm going to name Brian Scridland. And I'm there, what? I said, you're fucking around with me. He said, no, I'm naming you and Scridland. And I said, F -f -f listen, don't fucking do Sounds that. Sounds like two-thirds of a power play to me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, don't fucking do that. I, I'm not a fucking All-Star. What are you doing? Yeah. He said, listen. I know what you've done in this league for years. You, you guys never get recognized. Brian Scribble in the Montreal, I absolutely love him as a player. You could not believe how he was talking about you, Mike Milbury. Now, I know a lot of people <clears throat> have shit to say about him. I loved playing for Mike Milbury. As a coach, you yeah. would have loved him. And yeah. he said, no, I'm naming you and Brian Scribble your former teammate. <clears throat> I don't care what anybody says. I mean, don't do it. Don't do it. Anyway. It's unfortunate, but both of us ended up being injured for that all-star game in Chicago. I had a broken ankle I was walking around on for fucking three weeks before they found out. They thought it was sprained. They, they, they would give me, I, oh, you're a pussy. You're not going to go to the all-star game? I, I mean, I can't even right. fucking walk. I, I had tears yeah. in my, I ended up having surgery. And you had, I think, in, did you have an ankle injury or a knee? Were you playing basketball? Was the, was were you playing the, uh, basketball too? Was, is, that, is that how you hurt your It no. was the morning skate. <laughs> we were in St. Louis. It was the morning skate two days before the All-Star game. Oh. And I'm out in front of the net deflecting pucks. <clears throat> and I deflected one right into the ankle. And I thought, yeah, are you kidding ankle? me? Wow. So I went back to the, to the uh, hotel. We had lunch. I put my foot in a bucket. And more or less slept like that all afternoon. There's no way I'm not going to this all-star game because there's no way I'm ever getting invited back. So, uh, so anyway, I, I realist, realist, right? So I, uh, I played that night in St. Louis and uh, never took my shoe off, never took my skate off. I always undid my skates in between periods, never took it off. And when that game was over, and I took my skate off. Oh. It just went, wow. Oh, it was oh. like, okay, so over to the hospital. And sure as shit, I got two fractures in there. And it's like, jet. Anyway, I still went to the All-Star game because I wanted the photo, which I still have the <laughs> hockey part. Uh, I have the the jersey. There you, you go, man. See. I got there that go. Congratulations. But I couldn't walk. I just couldn't. And I ended up not going. Um, but yeah. You know, I think Mike was a little mad that I didn't go to it, but regardless, we put that that's water under the bridge. We had him on earlier um on the podcast and he was awesome. I absolutely I love Mike Milbury. People always got something to say about him, but would you guys uh, been like in the skills you know, competition? 
Like, is it, you guys oh, oh, yeah, I'm right through it. <laughs> I would tip, tip, <laughs> tip and pucks. Tip and pucks, we would have been. The tip and puck drill. <laughs> Fucking Ray I Moore couldn't shooting. even do that right. Yeah, they're like, you guys are in fastest skater. You guys are like, we can't even skate. Speaking, of, speaking of Mike Milbury, how about if somebody shit an issue when he went a few times into the crowd? <laughs> oh. oh, so... You end up going down. You'd be the first captain of Florida Panthers. Then you know you did a little stint with the Rangers. Uh, you went to the final in Florida. Uh, how weird was that playing hockey in Florida back then? You know, after being in Montreal, oh in Canada, right? Crazy, right? What, could, what was the adjustment there for you? If, if you could imagine how goofy we were with three days off in LA, yeah. give me three hundred and sixty-five oh, yeah. <laughs> days in a row in Florida. <laughs> and, and, you know, the best part, we played in Miami. We had South Beach. Uh, we had great support down there. Like, people just love the game of hockey. And all of a sudden, it just it, it just took off. It was just nuts. And we got people up at our practice rink every single day. And then, of course, once you become a winner, uh, yeah. people love a winner. Yeah. So when we beat Pittsburgh um, to go on to the finals against Colorado, I wish somewhere we would have, as an organization – just flew home from from Pittsburgh back to uh, Fort Lauderdale, Miami at that point in time, just to see what was going on and the vibe, because it was absolutely nuts. But we went off to Colorado, lost the first two games, uh, came home, and then it was like, wow, feel this energy. I mean, you, you're driving down the I-95 at night, and they got rats yeah, in shadow going rats? up the side of buildings, for God's sake. I mean, it was just goofy. And our practice rink, you couldn't pull into. I mean, the, the school buses and, and of kids, it was just, it was crazy. Anyway, we all loved it, and it was uh, quite an opportunity. And there's another franchise that hasn't been back there for a number of years, and uh, I wish them the best to get back on track as well. Yeah, it'd be nice. Um, and then off to Dallas, you get reunited with, with Bob Ganey and company, and you get to two more finals, right? You you win one. Well, and I had a I had a, one. I had a pit stop in New York. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. After, after Florida. Now, what, one what of was my, that pit stop all about? Yeah. Oh, one of my favorite stories. So Keener and I got traded. We picked up that summer expansion draft. I had hurt my knee at the end of the season in Florida. Uh, was rehabbing. We played the Rangers in the uh, first round that year. They ended up beating us. But I was doing all my training and everything traveled with the team skating. I was feeling pretty good. I think if that game, if that series would have went to six or seven, I, I might've had a chance of being able to come back. Uh, however, uh, as time went on, didn't work out, picked up by the Rangers that summer uh, and had the opportunity of playing with the greatest player that's ever played the game, arguably for some uh, Wayne wow. Gretzky. So a quick little story about Gretz. And he was just one of the most fabulous teammates, but one of those guys that, like, it didn't matter where you went. Somebody said, hey, there's Wayne Gretzky. There's Wayne Gretzky. I mean, he was the the tops of tops, right? right. So here we are. He's getting ready to go to San Jose for the All-Star game. So I said to him, I, we're the last couple guys left in the room. I said, Gretz, why don't you go get your sticks, and uh, I'll give you a hand out to, the, out to your car with, the, uh, with your bag. He goes, right on. Thanks, Gurry. And so anyway, well, he was in getting his sticks. I put a 25-pound weight in the bottom of his bag and uh, <laughs> signed. I had already pre-signed 50 Brian Scrudland hockey cards. So I threw those all in his hockey gloves. So anyway, we're, he comes out of the stick room. He says, okay, I'm ready to go. So I grabbed, a, I grabbed the sticks. He goes, what, what are you doing? I said, well, I said I'd give you a hand with your stuff. Get out to your car. He goes, oh, okay. So he went to go pick up his bag now. Oh, geez. I said, well, you probably haven't picked up one of those since you were 10 years old. So he throws that bag on his shoulder and away we go. So I get a phone call the next day and screwy. Yep. Gretz, how you doing? Yep. Good. He says, I just arrived in the dressing room. We had a 25 pound weight in front of my stall, 50 Brian Scrudland autographed <laughs> hockey card. I just want to let you know that everybody participating in this year's all-star game will get one of your hot signed hockey cards. <laughs> oh. <laughs> anyway, just a, oh, we had fun. There was one time Keener and I always drove together. So there was one time Gretz wanted a ride. 
So anyway, we end up, we head over to, uh, and we're flying out of uh, Westchester uh, that yeah. day. So I got a, there's a couple of little hidden gems out in the woods. So we go out there, we have lunch, a couple of beers, we leave. Not one person has said, there's Wayne Gretzky, there's Wayne Gretzky, or let's get something signed, right? So we get in the car, Gretz says, oh, that was an awesome lunch. I'm coming, we're doing this next time. I said, oh, I got another spot. We'll go there next time. No, 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 same spot. <laughs> so, sure as shit, we do. The next time we show up, and as soon as we roll in and, and order, well, the bartender, he's got about 50,000 things for, for Gretz to sign. Right? <laughs> so it didn't work out quite the same, but... Oh, it was just a thrill playing with those guys. And then there was times, you know, you didn't actually want to go to the All-Star game and meet those guys because they were really nice guys. Didn't feel the same when you were sticking them in the back of the knees a couple of days later. Right. (laughs) Um, Yeah, crazy times. So you you go from New York to Dallas, and it's like old home week there, right? And was there a sense of comfort there for you, you know, coming back? being with those familiar faces that you won with in Montreal and knowing that Bob was at the helm? Guaranteed. Without a doubt, yeah. Knuckles, uh, you know, and uh, from day one, it just seemed like a marriage. It was uh, – now, the boys are telling me, and Keener beforehand, uh, Hitch, Ken Hitchcock, if we screw up in the first five minutes of practice, make a couple of bad passes, he just blows the whistle and says, okay, brings us all in. Guys, tomorrow when you show up, we need more concentration. We need more effort. Get the hell out of here and whatever, wherever your brains are, don't bring the same brain tomorrow type of thing. <laughs> so anyway, whistle goes to sure as shit. Medano, Neuendijk, and Letnin, first drill of the practice, my, our very first practice. They can't even make a three-foot pass, those guys, and world's <laughs> greatest players, right? So he blows the whistle. I'm thinking, oh, good. I'll be able to get the hell out of here and find a place to live. So he blows the whistle, brings us all in and says, um, boys, this is bullshit. We got two new guys here and blah, blah, blah. And anyway, on the goal line. Well, I'm sca- I, I got to put my hand up, hey, just like I'm in class. He goes, what do you want? I said, well, the boys are telling me that if they screw up on some passes, you, you send them home. I said, you're not doing this skating for me, are you? He goes, you get on the goal line with Medano and uh, New and Bank and Lettinen. And so, so, you know, away I go. Well, they're already down and back. I'm just hitting our, our near blue line, for Christ's sake. Anyway, I, Hitch and I had a good relationship. We had a lot of laughs. Uh, I was just at Mike Keene's event in Winnipeg. Oh, I had to tell one when we won that cup in 99. Uh, the following year, we're all sitting in the back room and Hitch didn't want us to skate that first day. He just said, no, we're just having a meeting today. So anyway, we all show up. We're in the back room. I got Kirky Muller sitting to the left of me. He's eating a ham sandwich. Keener's to the right of me. The coach's door opens up. Well, here comes Hitch leading all the coaches. He's got a brand new, nice, shiny green track suit on. Well, Keener says, hey, Hitch. Why don't you get a couple more pockets put in that tracksuit? You look like a billiard table. <laughs> Next thing you know, there's a ham sandwich coming out of Muller's nose. The boys are laughing their asses off. So, so this is back in the day you were allowed to do that. Well, the next day we're on the ice. Good skate. We come off the ice. Keener's sitting to the left of me in the dressing room. He's bending down on doing his skates. Well, here comes Hitch. You know, Hitch was a... A slender 340 back then, I think, or three, yeah. 335-ish. No, actually, yeah, yeah, 335-ish. Anyway, he goes and he puts his hands on the back of Keener's neck. And he said, uh, that was a pretty smart comment you made yesterday when I came out of the coach's office. Keener says, Hitch, I'll give you three seconds to get your hand off my fucking neck or you're going down. Well, two, one, he grabbed the big boy by the calves, which, you know, Boom. Stands up, not, Hitch goes down, the whole dressing room shakes a little bit. Keener crawls on top of him with his left cocked and says, what do you think, fellas? Should I? <laughs> <laughs> like, that shit just doesn't happen doesn't, today. No, no, that doesn't happen at all. How I is, mean, that uh, was true. 
That was camaraderie. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> How was uh, – we heard a couple stories the other day about uh, Brad Hall. You got any stories of him? How was playing with him? Well, Holly – now, here, here was part of the deal. Holly needed the extra skating, too, because he wasn't oh, yeah. exactly slender. <laughs> the, two, the two slenderest guys on the team, Hitch and Holly, they would stand around, and Holly would get him into a conversation, about a 10-minute conversation, while the rest of us are doing laps. It's like, hang up the curse. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, we'd come to a stop, at Darian Hatcher would say, okay, enough of this shit. Holly, start skating, you lazy bastard. <laughs> No. Oh, he was a daddy. He was one of the, you know, it was every day. It was the New York crossword. It was, I mean, he was a wonderful conversationalist. Get on the bus, the storytelling. I mean, I just absolutely love the guy. And he was uh, definitely, when when Brett came on to the Dallas Stars, Bob Gainey had the veteran leadership group uh, come up to his office. And it was laid out pretty simple. We have an opportunity to add one of the greatest, purest goal scorers of all time to our lineup. Now, it's up to you guys to monitor off the ice and to make sure that he's putting in on the ice. And we're not doing the deal unless you guys are taking ownership of this as well. Once again, you're 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 involving the players. I mean, that was Bob's way. We we felt empowered by that, and uh, and Holly didn't let us down both on the ice and off the ice. Just a great guy. Well, Bob, uh, as manager, I remember, uh, and I heard this story, and I'm sure you did. I mean, Hitch had a weight problem, and he was coaching Junior. And Bob, yes. and S- Bob's son, Stephen, played for Hitch and Junior. And I, I guess Bob, when he talked to him, he said, listen, Hitch, I want to hire you up here, but, you know, you got to get yourself in some type of shape here because to go up – there and tell these professionals what they have to do and how they got to do it and all this to be overweight. It's going to be tough to do. And apparently Hitch, right. he lost the weight. I, I don't know if he ever kept, I don't think he kept it off the whole time, but you know, he found it. Yeah. 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 He found it. But Bob, again, Bob, the, the mind, the way he thinks and the stuff he does, like it's a little different. And I, I, that impressed me about Bob, honestly. Yeah. Uh, Different different type of fella, but uh, always impressed with Bob Ganey. My wife would always say, whenever she would get mad at me, she'd say, well, why don't you just go to some dark bar and hide in the corner with Bob? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know what that was like, Knuckles? Oh, you yeah, I do. Lost, you could get lost in that dark corner for a couple of days. <laughs> oh. Fuck. I'll never forget. Bob brought me to, you ever go to Ferguson's with him? Oh, I think once or a hundred. He fucking <laughs> grabbed me one night. He said, come on, I got to take you somewhere. So, all right, we fucking get out cab and we're walking through an alley, coming back down next real obscure place, the East end of Montreal. And I'm like, where the fuck are we going? You know? And all of a sudden he, he knocks on this thing, and then a fucking door opens up there, and the guy's okay, one minute, and we fucking won't. We come up the stairs, and all of a sudden, we're in this old bond building, and fuck, there's a beautiful little bar in there, and I'm there. Wow, how'd you find this? Oh, a friend of mine, he makes beer, and they had the dartboard, pool table. You didn't pay for anything, no exchange of cash. They just kept the chit, and. You know, yeah. they made their own beer, and we sat there and drank all night in that dark corner. And I, it, it was cool. It was a good experience. But Bob, that was, that was Bob. I'll never forget the day we won the Stanley Cup, <clears throat> and we were running run around town at night. Me, Chelly, Bob. I think you were there. I don't know if you remember, but we're in the, uh, we're walking downtown at St. Catherine. We're walking by this pizza place, and a uh, guy jumped out of his car, left it parked double parked and he ran in to get his pizza. Well, Bob jumped in the fucking car and disappeared. <laughs> B- B- Bob Ganey, Captain of the Montreal Canadiens. He jumped in the car and took off, left us all there. Yeah, we didn't see him on the next day. Where the fuck did he go? Like, I don't, I think he went to Ferguson's without us, but you know, just uh, some awesome stories. Awesome teammates. I, guy, you know, uh, and this is always hard to ask someone. It's hard to answer. Um, 
four Stanley Cup finals. Now, like you said, that first year, you think, oh, I'll be back there every year. Fuck. It is so yeah. fucking hard to win that trophy. It's hard to get to the final. And I, I <clears throat> sometimes I think of guys, you know, who've gotten there and then come up short and never win it and never get yeah. back there, right? Wow. I'm so grateful to have won one. You got two. You've been to the fucking yeah. Stanley Cup final four times. It, you know, that that's incredible. Like, I don't care, okay, the dynasty teams and all that, but to to do it, you did it with three different teams. And it says a lot about you, yes, and the teams you were with. But, but like, can, can you imagine have gone your whole career and never, never even got a sniff? Like, Not now when you look back. And, and when you look back, what was the most important one for you? Or the, I mean, I, I think I know, but what was the most important one? Oh, that there, there's nothing like learning from experience. And that first year, uh, you know, winning it. I mean, you, you, as you mentioned to all of us to start with, when you win here, you are a king. When you lose mm-hmm. here, get the fuck out of town. <laughs> you know, I mean, we lost the second year and somebody burnt Carbo's house down for fuck's sake. <laughs> like, remember? Yeah. Like what? What's going yeah. on here, honey? We're not buying. We're not, but we're only renting. So, I mean, it, that was that was what it was all about. I mean, that you know, I was able to take all of those experiences, um, and and share them. Uh, I played when when I arrived in Florida. We didn't have a lot of guys with that type of experience, but they sure liked the fact that. I had, and I was able to share it. And we, we had a really good group of guys. There was no, we didn't have a lot of big heads back then. It was just, we're going to go yeah. out and work our ass yeah. off. And, and this is how we do it. And, and it, you know, as, as it was taught from day one, Knuckles, you don't win a Stanley Cup in a game sometimes. You win it in practice and by learning how to practice. Uh, yeah. We were the opposite of Ellen Iverson. You know, we, we yeah. really competed. We, we competed our asses off in practice, which made games easy. Who the hell is going to go out and embarrass themselves in front of 18,000 people? You know you're going to have the energy to do that. But when you're practicing in front of one another and trying to, you know, I mean, every day I was trying to impress you. I'm trying to impress, you know, my teammates, show them how, how willing I am to, to compete for this thing. And I, you know, that sort of stuff just can never be, uh, I don't know, I played to win. I played to win every day yeah, I came to the rink. I had one thing on my mind, and that was to be a Stanley Cup winner. And I think if you don't talk about it, you probably your chances aren't that great. I mean, we talked about it. You guys, uh, yeah. Bob had, what, four? Larry had five. Yeah. Uh, we had Mario had four or five. We had Stanley Cups, and then every day, of course, the guys that were around with nine or ten. How about the cock with ten, and he didn't know where four of them were? <laughs> the old cock. Hey, I mean, the st- old cock. Second winning guy with ten Stanley Cups. Oh. I mean, God. And, and, and didn't we work hard for those guys, Knuckles? Oh. I mean, I remember, you know, we did everything for those trainers. Here, here's one for you, though. When I, mm-hmm. So we end up, uh, just a quick trainer story. And Eddie, of course, loved his Molson had Bad goat in his elbow. Oh, I, I think it was greedy. I think it was greedy. Always said, is- Eddie, get the latch, get the latch in. <laughs> so put the latch against the table. Tim, anyway, we went his elbow. In- his elbow, Eddie's elbow was like all fluid, oh. right? Just his big ball Eddie- of fluid. And and Greeny <laughs> Eddie- used to come up behind him. And stick his finger in it. He go, <laughs> he poke it. He go, fuck off. If, Eddie, oh. if Eddie's nose was ever get decapitated, they just cut his elbow <laughs> off and put it on there. Anyway, here, here we are. We're in Minneapolis. We go out for dinner. We go out for dinner. Dinner. I always took the trainers a few times during the year. So got Eddie all all cucumbered up before we headed out, <laughs> get into the restaurant. Well, that day I went out with my agent Barney Harris. He was from Minneapolis. He said, "Hey, have you got um, you got a shoe store, used shoe store downtown here at all?" He goes, "What are you doing now?" I said, "Oh no, let's just." He says, "Yeah, there's one right around the corner." So we went. I bought a, a size seven. I think I paid eight dollars for these shoes. So anyway, over to the steakhouse we go, and. Uh, 
we lopped the heels off of the shoes and Eddie loved a filet mignon butterfly, right? Yeah. So that, so the later that day, when we came back with Bernays sauce. So <laughs> when we came back, my buddy at the restaurant, he had put the grill marks in the shoe heels and done up the whole plate. We're all sitting there. They're serving us all our dinner. They serve Eddie his. Well, he goes, he grabs his fork. He can't get that fork in the in the shoe heel that he thinks is his filet mignon. Now he grabs his knife. Maybe the knife will work. <laughs> anyway, he pushed he push that plate into the center of the table. This is the worst fucking steak I've ever had in my life. Fuck! And I said, whoa, whoa, here comes my buddy Pat around the corner with his new plate. I'm not fucking eating another one of those things. He threw <laughs> That was it. He didn't even know. He just left, jumped in the cab, and went home. The rest of us just laughed our asses off. Well, the boys are wondering, what the fuck? So I took those shoe heels, <laughs> held them up. Oh, the tra- the other trainers that were with us, I think two of them shit themselves and one still peeing his pants. Oh, my good Lord. What a riot. I just love that guy to death. Oh, he's the best. Wow. The best. Yeah. I remember going to see him um, when I moved back here, and he wasn't well. You know, he was in the hospital. Yeah. He was always so scared of the hospital, right? Didn't want to go. He, he finally passed on. But, um, yeah, Eddie was awesome. God rest his soul. One, one of the best. Man. Oh, yeah, yeah, great man. He he lived for it, loved it, and, you know, for this whole well, life. Well, all of sure. those trainers, you know, all of those trainers, they worked so hard. Yeah. I mean, the best. behind the scenes, you know. And then then the one day I'm going to play a prank on that. Steema. New, I new, saw Steema the other day. But anyway, go ahead. Trainer. I said, hey, can you uh, – can you uh, I, can you get me a bucket of steam? You know, one of those old shit comments back in the day. Yeah. Well, this this young guy, new trainer, I think day two on the job, he comes in. He comes rolling in with the hydrocolator machine. <laughs> <laughs> Wheeled her right in front of me. He says, a bucket here, of steam. Here's, your, here's your steam, right? <laughs> so from that day on, I said, well, we got to call you steamer. He's, I think yeah. he's still got the handle today, doesn't he? He does. I saw him uh, last week. I was at the Bell Center. I saw him in the garage. I said, hey, steamer, how are you yeah. doing? He said, that's like a screwy. What a great man. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, we had, some, we had some good chuckles back then. No so question. Chuckles like? with knuckles. <laughs> Chuckles yeah. with knuckles. Yeah, it's our new uh-huh. podcast name. What was it like winning in Dallas? Was it it's kind of similar? Oh man. Well, the expectations were there, right? And and uh, like when I look back on that and look back on that team, we we were we were meant to win. There's no doubt about it. There was no doubt that we were we weren't going to lose. There's no uh, that just wasn't even in the conversation. Um, we had a really, I mean, I think that might've been one of the very best hockey teams I'd ever played on, uh, you know, Nui and Medano and Zuboff and Hatch. And I mean, there was yeah. just no screwing around. It was late loaded with uh, veteran guys. And then that Keener, I mean, he just, you know, he yeah. always rose when, when the time was right. That bugger was just a hell of a hockey player and, yeah. you know, Lutz. And it was so much fun to reunite Carbo and uh, we yeah. just had a riot. And, and off the ice, I mean, there was really no curfews. We all just we all just wanted to win. We knew what it would take, the commitment, and uh, and we held in there, man. I'll tell you what, that was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, and, and, been- and not to mention, there were 36,000 people that showed up for the parade. <laughs> <laughs> Boring. <laughs> so, oh my god! So obviously, hey, not everything. Not everything's bigger in Texas. <laughs> yeah, not everything. That's I, sure. I'll tell you that parade in Quebec. Oh. That Texas thing don't hold a handle to it. No way. Wow. Uh, winning in New Jersey, you have it in a fucking parking lot. Hello. <laughs> um, but it, it, listen, it, you've been generous with your time. I, I just, I want to. Just get your thoughts on today's game and the way the game is with no red line. Uh, would you ever think of putting it back in? What do you think of today's players and the way you have to handle them? And what's your take on today's game? 
I absolutely love watching the game today. I am a big fan. I rarely miss a hockey game. I drive Lana nuts because I'm down here in that man cave enjoying the shit out of every game. And, you know, out west here, they start at 5 o'clock. I love the playoffs because it seems to start at 4 and you go right through till hopefully a triple overtime at 2 a.m. Uh, still love the game. Love the, uh, uh, you know, yeah, the players change. There's no doubt about that. I mean, I, I wonder sometimes on how these stories are going to be and how uh, a podcast is going to survive oh. when – Hey, uh, uh, you know, remember when we'd go on the road and we'd arrive and and then we'd take our Atari machines and there'd be eight of us in a room all playing yeah. at the same time? Yeah. Oh, can you imagine? What? <laughs> I mean, 17 years on the road, I never got room service once. Yeah. yeah. All right. Crazy. So, you know, I, but the game itself, I mean, it's fantastic. I, I, I love the uh, I love the red line being gone. Uh, I'm not a defenseman, but I guarantee you without that red line back in the day, we'd have somebody, we'd be burying somebody by now. Yeah. Um, right. You know, I mean, that's, uh, that's the scary part. The speed is just incredible. I couldn't imagine. I mean, I used to, we used to surf or uh, water ski behind yeah. guys for five minutes a shift. Christ, I'd probably get thrown right over the glass if I was hanging on to McDavid. I was going to ask you, like, what do you think? You think you would be able to adjust and play today's no clutching and grabbing, none of that? Like, how would you think you'd be in today's game? Well, let's put it this way. I still can't get the old style out of my game. So when I play in these senior, when I play in some of these fundraising events and, you know, you lay your stick on somebody and they just Mm. stop, eh? They just stop. <laughs> what are you doing? That's, that's, what are you doing? That's, that's a psycho. Well, that's it, illegal. Ain't game, it ain't my game, big boy. As I go, you know, by them, and but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, you know the even the the skates, the sticks. I mean, the sticks have so much of an impact on everybody shoots the puck today, right? Yeah. I mean, they can all rifle that puck. They can skate like the wind. Uh, and, you know, their training is incredible. It's really hockey-specific today. Uh, you know, the stuff they're doing, the the Michigan. I mean, yeah. Christ, I've tried the Michigan. I, I ended up three miles from home. I was just trying to pick the puck up on my stick. Fuck, by the time I realized I finally did it, I was three and a half miles from the house. Fuck, that's a long way to wrap it around the net, man. Crazy shit. Yeah, it's fun, though. And there's and there's some really there's some fun kids out there to watch too, and oh. hear some of their interviews and stuff. So I'm not giving up on them yet. I like that little Zegers. I like I li- he's kind of cocky, but God, what talent! Like you know, like I'm sorry, but th- did he have that fucking puck crazy glued to his stick in the All Star game? Insane. Like is that not nuts or what? Yeah, like that's yeah. just crazy. I, I oh, so I my it. request. If Trevor Zegris listens to Knuckles, Raw Knuckles podcast, <laughs> my only or any of those guys who can do the Michigan, my only wish is that they can do the Michigan, put it in the back of the net, pull it back out, and then go over to the ref and hand it to him. <laughs> Never even touch the ice. <laughs> That's gonna be my that'll be my vote of play of the year. Uh, listen, so you're in Calgary. Daryl Sutter. Obviously, a guy. I love this guy. I love him. He's the one Sutter brother when I was playing hockey that I played against that I liked. Yeah. I hated the rest of them. I love him. Um, I love him as a coach. I love what he did in L.A. I, he's old school. I know there's a shelf life. But, God, he's just a guy who demands and expects guys to show up and play and for some reason, some guys just can't do it today. Well, What's the bottom that line is you, you, got, you got to have somebody in the dressing room that's going to push these guys. A coach coach can only push you so far. Well, doesn't they have Luchik, I mean, you Luchik a few guys? you got some guys there, right? Well, that's why. You know, does Luch feel comfortable at only making, what, team, $18 million a year when some guys are making 36 Like, whoa, whoa, I can't say anything. <laughs> anyway, they're all set of story. I could, when Daryl took over here and uh, I was still I around him. and and, and anyway, uh, Greg Gilbert, Brad McCrimmon, they let those two go. I was still on board. So Daryl, yeah. of course, his first comment, why are you still here? Oh, Jesus <laughs> so Christ. I, I said to him, I said, because I got the answers, right? 
He goes, oh, yeah? So anyway, <laughs> we had some great conversations. So it comes to game one. We're playing the Anaheim Mighty Ducks. He says, who's in charge of the PK? Well, I am. Okay, well, run it the way you always have. I'll just be a participant today. We'll see how it goes. Well, I started probably the wrong thing. But I always fuck around, fuck around. You won't be around to fuck around. I never, ever <laughs> listened to that. And I should have. <laughs> so anyways, the video starts. I've got the flying V from the movie. <laughs> we got to prepare for the night, right? All I heard was a door slam. <laughs> the door slammed. It was like I looked around. Daryl's gone. Uh, so I, anyway, we finished the, we finished the PK meeting. I walk into the room, screw you, get in here. <laughs> so, away I go, waddled into the room. He goes, you can't have fun with these fucking losers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I got it. I got it. They weren't winning at the time and, and they weren't putting out. So oh, sure as shit, you know, he turned that team around. There they were a year later in the Stanley Cup Finals, and if there was better, uh, if there was better camera angles, I'm quite certain that that Marty Jell and a goal would have counted, and Tampa yeah. wouldn't have celebrated that Stanley Cup. Anyway, yeah. that's hindsight, but Daryl pushed those guys, and he yeah. had a bunch of good veteran guys, including one of the greatest right wingers of all time, and Jerome McGinley. Yeah. And you know, in all fairness to Jerome. Uh, he he ran that team. However, yeah. you can only you can only go so hard. He needed even more support as it went along. And they had that great great goaltender in Kiprasov as well. Which, you know, at the end of the day, without a goalie, you you really probably not winning the Stanley Cup. Yeah. Screwy, um, awesome stuff. Um, awesome to have. Fuck, I gotta have you again. Jesus, yeah. I already want you yes. back on. I could just keep going. It's amazing. This has been freaking awesome. Uh, I oh, we're just warming up. If you, you know, I'm, I'm all done with stories. He's, he's ready for part some... two. He's ready for part two of the pod two. I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. We got to do part, part two. two. <laughs> you call oh. it the number two. Oh, the number two in the skates. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jesus. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. A lot well, of it's been great. Night. Great to see you as well, Chris. And you're doing well. Yeah, everything's good, uh, Brian. You know, good for you, man. mom is having a tough time. You know, my dad passed a few years back, two years yeah. back, and uh, yeah. my mom's got the dementia. But the family's all good, you know. And that's uh, a tough one. All we can well, my pops far. turned in eighty-five here and and was God inducted at the uh, was inducted at eighty years of age into the uh, hockey hall of fame, as yeah. they've got a whole different category for those still active playing at eighty. And then, of course, yeah. he gets his knee done, shoulder done, and then Mr. Parkinson's comes knocking on the door. Oh, you know, shit. I mean, ah, what a shitty deal. Anyway, well, we got a, it's a lesson for us all to enjoy every day while we're above ground, eh? Well, listen, I'm going to tell you, I wish I could do it again, but while you can, um, you know, kiss Mr. Scrollin right on the lips because I wish I could kiss my father on the lips again. I tell you that. <laughs> you got I it, do. buddy. Listen, yeah, I know. Um, all the best to you, and I appreciate your time. You're awesome. And what I said at the beginning, I mean, one of my favorite people in the world, one of my favorite teammates ever, and uh, no bullshit. Call it like you see it. You got a backbone made of fucking steel. And Thanks, I absolutely man. love you. Awesome. And do me now, one favor. Now, the only, my only request is to receive one of them raw knuckles, size large T-shirts, please. Oh, you please. got it. Send me it might the be an extra large. We want one so of you your cards. Large, <laughs> you give us one of your signed cards. We'll do it. <laughs> hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Raw Knuckles podcast. We'd really appreciate it if you'd like, Subscribe and share with a friend.